Okay, uh, we're just about to start the uh, webinar series on scale. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. One thing that Rainbow does is we offer these free of charge uh, webinars uh, throughout the spring. We've got about 30 of them planned. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be going into some of the detail on, um, on some of the upcoming uh, presentations. Uh, my name is Jeff Pache. I'm an arborologist, which is uh, basically a tech support specialist. Wait, hang on, Jeff. We're still waiting for people to fill into the room. So if you want to okay. All right, back, back up just a moment, thanks. <laughs> okay, okay. Want to wait till the top of the hour. Yeah, okay. Oh, I didn't know that we have a minute. We have, to, what, a minute to go? Yeah, so yeah, a we a remember minute. Zoom takes a while to filter people in. So welcome, okay. everyone. We good? Okay. No, we still have people filtering it. So just okay. hang on a second. You just give me a heads up and I'll, I can't see that. Um, oh, got it. And I cool. can't see the attendee uh, count. Okay. Well, uh, we're at the hour right now. And so uh, I'd like to start this presentation. Uh, thank you for taking uh, some time out of your schedule to sit in on this scale presentation. And Rainbow offers uh, 30 uh, webinars throughout the spring on various topics. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. And so we're gonna start, uh, my name is Jeff Pache. I'm an arborologist, which is basically a tech support specialist, along with Allison Harrell, who is also in, in the background today, along with uh, Patrick Anderson. Allison uh, lives out in Portland, Oregon, and Patrick lives just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And what we do is we support uh, our clients. We also support our technical managers or territory managers, I'm sorry. And we provide virtual and face-to-face -face training. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping information. If you do have a question, please do not use the chat box because it will become lost. Uh, please use the Q&A box under control panel. Um, this will be recorded. So you in the future can um, uh, visit and, and review this presentation. So you'll be uh, uh, sent a link. And this is uh, actually worth one ISA CEU. And so if you have questions, please put it in the, in the chat. And if you have not put in your ISA uh, number, put that also in the Q&A as well. And I'd like to introduce a fellow Buckeye, Joe Boggs, assistant professor at the Ohio State University. And just, uh, just a real brief, um, uh, you know, sort of bio on Joe. Uh, he has done, on an average, over 100 presentations. He's done television. He's done radio. Um, he's done a lot of work in uh, Asian longhorn beetle. And he has also co-authored many publications. And one of them I really want to highlight is this one right here, 20 questions on plant problem diagnostics. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to uh, Joe Boggs. And I know he's going to have a very entertaining and very educational presentation. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. So, uh, uh, Jeff, if you'll stop sharing, good. I will go ahead and bring up the yeah, bring up the presentation. Um, and hopefully, just a just to check to make sure everyone can see this. Is a uh, are we good? I've got you clear on my end. Outstanding. All right, so identification and management of some common scale insects in the Midwest. Now, just a little bit of a caveat here. Um, you know, I picked out some of the more troublesome. Certainly, there is not enough time to cover all scale insects you may come across in the Midwest. But like I said, I tried to pick out some that uh, 
that we deal with frequently, and uh, and then we can talk a bit about their management. Um, the 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 first big point, though, I want to make is now you know I know people are still coming in the room, and there's a great registration number. I chided, you know, well the registration numbers will probably start going down once I get started, because one thing that I'm just going to say flat out, we don't know everything. The challenge with scale insects, I would contend, is they're probably some of the least, uh, in recent years, least studied insect pests that we have out there. And that also very much includes efficacy data uh, with different insecticides. It, that's unfortunate, but it is a reality. Uh, also, you know, we've had some changes with different scales. We've had some different speciation and all that. Uh, so I just want to readily admit that if we look at the, take the long view, you know, the fact of the matter is our knowledge looks like this. What we know with this little tiny dot over here and then what we don't know, which actually this isn't big enough. It should just, it should cover, you know, more than just our screens. Uh, that just covered the entire state of Ohio, big shadow went over. In nature's infinite book of secrecy, a little I can read, that is a fact. That is a fact. However, we're human beings. And so we tend to fill in the blanks, what we don't know. We sometimes speculate. That's okay, as long as people know we're speculating, hypothesizing. Well, that's good because as you know, with the scientific method, you know, a hypothesis is part of the scientific method. You test it. So speculating, as long as people know, hypothesizing is not so bad. Presumption, well, now we're starting to get into an area where there could be problems. This is an idea that is taken to be true, but often used as a basis for other ideas, although is not known for certain. And then it gets a little worse. Conjecture and presumption are two different things. Conjecture is a little bit more of the idea that we're filling in the blanks. And finally, the ultimate filling in the blanks are wild haired guesses. These things can add up into fake news. I hate to tell you that, but that's a fact. And I'm not saying fake news intentionally. I'm saying this is news that we don't even maybe know that's fake. So what is the enemy of fake news? Facts, one of my favorite quotes. Everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. I'm dating myself just the facts. That was the tagline for this character way back when, but it remains true. So where can we get just the facts? And what is this, for example? Well, we have something in Ohio called the Buckeye Yard and Garden Line, or as we affectionately call it, the Beagle. It does fetch a timely information. Now, even though we say this is in Ohio, quite frankly, what we write about applies to much of the upper Midwest. So you could all perhaps tap into this if you wish. Now, every state, Michigan State has, you know, some timely updates, uh, Purdue, Penn State. I mean, there are a lot of the land grants that do this, but, but we try to do this 24 seven. These could arrive at any time in the form of what we call Beagle Alerts. Now this, if you sign up for this, this is what you'll get. You won't get anything in your email that's big. You'll just get this notification, you know, that it will give, you know, the title of the posting, Japanese beetle scale. And then if you want to learn more, you click on this hot link. And then for example, you know, Japanese maple scale, and this was covering this rather new scale for a lot of people. Here's another alert, calico scale crawls. So we also try to report, you know, very, very uh, important developmental points. Cottony maple leaf scale hiding in plain sight. This is an old friend. Some of you have been around long enough to recall that cottony maple leaf scale, which is different than cottony maple scale, although they are in the same genus, uh, these were once very common. Uh, I've been with Extension for now almost 30 years, and quite frankly, prior to coming to Extension and when I first came to Extension, this was a pretty common soft scale pest, but it disappeared for reasons we don't understand or know, and now it's on the way back, something just to be aware of. So here's how you subscribe, and I'll have this at the end. Of course, this is being recorded, so you can go back and even write this down. Just send a message to bygl-alert at list.osu.edu, and then in the subject line, subscribe to Beagle Alerts, and you could put, you know, we'll have your email address. You could put others in there if you have a 
others in your company that you would like to receive this, you can add their email or whatever, and then you'll be added to this list. So scale basics. As you all know, we divide scales into two general groups, soft scales and armored scales, which some people call hard scales. And of course, soft scales are so named because they can be squashed. But I'm gonna kind of go a little far afield just for a bit because um, I want everybody to be on the same page. And I think sometimes when we talk about scale insects, we skip over this very important perspective. It has to do with change in form or as we entomologists call it, metamorphosis. And you're all familiar with metamorphosis. I mean, you all know caterpillars, you know, like as monarch caterpillar, eventually pupate. And when we talk about butterflies, we call it a chrysalis. And then out of that, we see a complete change to the adult form. That's why it's called complete metamorphosis. But with scale insects, we're dealing with a different type of insect development called incomplete metamorphosis. I'm going to use milkweed bugs as an example because they're big and easy to take a lot of pictures of. And, and so the point being is this, all insects start as eggs. Scales start as eggs. Now, occasionally you'll hear people say that a scale gave live birth. It's probably more likely that the eggs were just held inside the female or under the female. And then the first instar uh, uh, nymphs you know, emerged from those eggs. There may be at least one or two scales that possibly the eggs emerged from inside the female, which could maybe be called a live birth. But I just wanna make sure you understand that all insects start with eggs. Those eggs hatch and then, and this is frankly the same with, it, with complete metamorphosis, as that immature insect gets larger, it has to do something. It's wrapped in a, an exoskeleton. Picture that as like a suit of armor. And so to get larger, it has to molt. It has to shed that exoskeleton in order to get larger. And so we call those molting and that's what they're doing. And this is what it looks like, for example, with these immature milkweed bugs. Each time they molt, we say that they are moving from one instar to the next, to the next, first, second, third, fourth. This is extremely important to understand because sometimes you'll read something we've written or in a talk, someone will say, well, first end stars do something and third end stars do something else, or they may have a different appearance. It's important to understand this concept. What about pupation? That does not occur in incomplete metamorphosis. You have from the last end star nymph, you have adults, and this is as large as the insect can get. They don't get any larger. So here we have, you know, nymphs of milkweed bug and the adult. Um, and this is important. For example, you know, if someone said, okay, well, here is a big mantid and there's a smaller mantid. This is not a baby of this. They both have wings. And that tells us that these are both adults of a different species. Very important to, to understand this. Because there's something else relative to scale development that separates armored scales from soft scales. With armored scales, only the first instar nymphs, now you see why it's, it's important to understand instars and nymphs, only the first instar nymphs are mobile. That's the only stage that moves around. And that's why we call them crawlers. So a little mix messaging here with soft scales, all stages of nymphs, all of the instar stages of nymphs are mobile. And we also call those crawlers. Very important to distinguish between the two and understand that. So I'm taking a little time here at the beginning. How do we detect these little tiny crawlers? Well, I like using double-sided tape. It's just very easy. You stick it on the tree, you can see it, and that will then capture these very tiny crawlers. Now, something else important to understand, insects are cold-blooded. Uh, their metabolism, their development is tied to temperature. So the warmer the temperature, let's do that again, the warmer the temperature, the faster this progresses. And that makes sense. You probably already know that, but that's important to comprehend because it leads to another connection. It, the same thing happens with plants. As we go from buckeye to, you know, the, uh, well, the buckeye, we go from leaves expanding to flowers to finally uh, the nuts. 
there's a joke in there somewhere relative to Buckeye nuts. We're all nutty. Yes, I know, the, particularly uh, when we play U of M, but that's another story. The point being is that since temperatures are also uh, 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 connected to developments with plants, we have this idea of phenology. Hopefully this is all review, but I'm just trying to connect some dots for you. So with phenology, this is where we have environmental events that occur that then lead to biological events. It could be birds migrating, snakes hibernating, leaves changing collars. These are all phenological events. In our case though, what we're wanting to do is connect phenological events between an environmental factor temperature and plants blooming, connecting to insects hatching or scale crawlers crawling. And so we have these phenological sequences. Now, since plants and insects are both tied to temperatures, that's a handy thing because for example, oyster shell scale, that is a armored scale. That's a scale with only the first instar crawlers being mobile. And so it's very good to understand, and that's a target, for example, with a number of, uh, of management options. So how do, you, how do you target that particular, how do you know this is about, well, watch Umbrella Magnolia or actually Miss Kim Lilac. Miss Kim Lilac is a wonderful tie and it has been consistent. And there's a very important point to all this. Year to year dates may change when these events happen, but the sequencing doesn't ever change. Miss Kim Lilac doesn't bloom way before oyster shell scale. By the way, while I'm looking at this, it just occurred to me, here's how I use this. <clears throat> Let's go to degree days, and I want to get into how to, I use this. Now, it's the same idea, but now I've added something that's a calculated sequencing, growing degree days. We won't go into a whole, uh, a whole lot about what that means, other than it is a way of using basically temperature accumulation to predict something. And you can see that uh, red buckeye, their full bloom is at 471. And it would appear to you that this is quite a distance, but you know when all this is happening, going from 471 to 497 can happen almost in a blink of the eye. We're talking springtime. And so we're, you know, this can accumulate very quickly and it, within a day or two. I have to, to be able to find orchard shell scale crawlers. I actually start monitoring red buckeye, but I know the Miss Kim, when they're blooming, I know that by golly, they're out there. I need to be out there looking. Now, this is not intended for targeting. You don't want to set up your targeting of insecticides, for example. That's not what the intention is. This is for monitoring or planning or saying, okay, we have a client that has a real problem with oyster shell scale. You know you want to start paying attention in terms of planning things as we start approaching these uh, accumulated growing degree days. Again, year to year dates may change, but se sequence doesn't change. Now here in Ohio, we do have this phenological calendar. Uh, you know, what I would suggest if you're in Michigan, but also other states have these, uh, just find them. But if you're in Michigan, for example, you just use a, a zip code that's up near, you know, where the two states join. It's close enough. But again, the phenological uh, indicator plants, you know, that's gonna be accurate everywhere. All right, <clears throat> skipping ahead just a little bit. Back to scales, I'm not running my video because of uh, putting too much down the pipeline, but you know, you can get an idea what I look like. So an overview with soft scales versus armored scales. The first thing with soft scales is of course, the body's covered by a leathery exoskeleton with soft scales, armored scales, hard waxy shell. So we have calico scale, I can squash these, pine needle scale, not so much. Usually, of course, soft scales are much larger. And here's a very important point. With soft scales, we see a lot more potential for high numbers of eggs per female. It is not to say armored scale populations can't develop rapidly, but certainly with soft scales, because of this potential for a higher number of eggs, we can see pretty rapid development. Again, as I've already said, with soft scales, all instar nymphs are mobile. With armored, only the first instar nymphs, and these are the crawlers for both. And this will happen throughout the, the immature stages. Uh, they hatch with calico, for example, as my poster child, and then they move out you know, to the leaves to feed, and then they move back to the stems to overwinter. 
That's only with soft scales. With armored scales, you get the eggs hatching and the crawlers go out and, and uh, well, actually you get males and females. They mate, the crawlers go out and they settle and then that's the end of it. Soft scales produce honeydew, armored scales produce no honeydew. And then finally, systemic insecticides may be effective against soft scales. And we're gonna get into exactly why here in just a second. But we looked at soft scales and say, all right, more likely systemic insecticides are effective with armored scales. There's a bit of a challenge there. Uh, the one exception is dinotefron. And typically we're looking at maybe using topicals, but always keep something in mind. If I forget to say this, just keep it in mind. I'm gonna emphasize it for certain scales, but again, I may forget to say this, but if you're using a topical, remember these insects have enemies. And the topical insecticide you choose and the timing could affect those enemies. It could mean that you're moving in the direction of actually amplifying the scale population because you've taken away the natural controls. Don't ever forget that. So now we're going to really zero in on the scale feeding activity. And for example, why do systemics work a little better for soft compared to armored scales? So here we have armored scales feeding. Here they fly in very long piercing sucking mouth parts, but notice what they're doing. They're inserting those mouth parts into plant cells. Now those cells are damaged, they die, and then we start seeing evidence of that. We see symptomology, this, uh, uh, what we would call uh, stippling chlorosis, you know, these very small areas. Little true and false question, then armored scales exude honeydew. I hope you all answer false because they are feeding on plant cells. So we take a look, for example, uh, I apologize, EHS, uh, that's, that's uh, elongate hemlock scale. Here we have males and females. They do have, many of them do have males and females. And there they are underneath the, uh, uh, the needles uh, producing these tangled filaments. But I wanna emphasize something, they do have enemies. You know, here we have a lace wing larva, not lace bug. Remember, bugs are bad. Lace wing is a predator with these big sickle shaped mandibles just going in there and feeding on the scale. So here's a good example. It's a Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens with uh, elongate hemlock scale. It has a pretty wide host range. We're gonna talk a little more about that in just a minute. But uh, solution fur, for example, here's a solution fur 2015, you can see the population 16 and then 17. And they did not spray. They do not spray at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens. They don't use insecticides. There's a whole nother story about that. There's a whole nother talk that I talk about why that's true, but suffice to say, it's not just to protect the animals. They actually don't need to spray because they have so many plants uh, that attract pollinators, which are also enemies of other insects. Uh, that they get a lot of natural controls. And you can see what's happened with no spraying, that population has dropped. Now in 2019, I need, it started coming back. So as with other insects, armored scales can cycle, high populations, low populations. We sometimes hit the panic button, in my opinion, too soon. And do not forget, if we're going symptomology, I mentioned stippling, here's EHS, I hem elongate hemlock scale. However, the stippling is primarily from spruce spider mite. So sometimes you have more than one pest, obviously, to think about. Okay, now what about feeding by soft scales? The poster child is going to be calico scale, uh, also magnolia scale, and they do something very different. I wanted to do this kind of slowly. There's that long piercing sucking mouth part, but what are they tapping into? They're tapping into phloem bundles. Now, remember, when we talk about plants, what plants do, food flows through phloem. So this is like tapping into a big fire hose with a lot of water, sugar water flowing through. They do a little damage. That's kind of inconsequential. But they are withdrawing. They have to withdraw huge quantities of sugar water to get at what they're also trying to get at, amino acids. Now, what are amino acids? Those are building blocks of protein. They do, they do extract some of the carbohydrates. That's where they get their carbon. So they do extract some, but they also have to extract a lot of fluid in order to get at those little bit of amino acids. Well, a little side note, this is one reason why 
scale populations can be stimulated. They can be increased by using too much nitrogen fertilizer. Because what you're doing when you do that, you're actually increasing nitrogen, which is the which is contained within the amino acids. So you're actually shoving more amino acids through that tube. But suffice it to say, they're extracting a whole lot of sugar water to get at those amino acids. And this presents a waste disposal problem. And of course they solve it by passing out that extra sugar water in the form of honeydew. You know, entomologists have some very nice names for things. For example, solid, solid excrement we call frass. FRAS, F-R-A-S-S. That's kind of nice, isn't it, for standing for something else? Well, honeydew actually is scale diarrhea. So, you know, if you have a problem, you can just say, to, oh, I have to go uh, create some honeydew. It drips onto things, leaves, stems, structures, cars, and then it becomes colonized by black sooty molds. Now, black sooty molds alone really are, they're not pathogenic, but you know, there's always a concern that they can block photosynthesis. But this is, it's more of a nuisance issue. However, it can make forest plants look very bad. Now, once again, black sooty mold. If you see black sooty mold, are you talking about a, an armored scale or a soft scale? Well, armored scales do not exude honeydew because they tap into individual cells. Soft scales produce honeydew because they tap into phloem vessels. And this, the, you can see the black sooty molds and all kinds of different things. So here's a diagnostic inquiry. This is a real situation where I came across scotch pine in a Christmas tree plantation that was heavily infested with pine needle scale, but also the needles were blackened with black sooty mold. What's going on? And I have to admit, at, at first, I thought, wait a minute, you know, I always thought, you know, armored scales did not, you know, produce honeydew. So... Is this an exception to the rule? No, I had to look deeper because there was also an infestation of striped pine scale, which is a soft scale exuding honeydew. My point to you is avoid making a quick draw diagnosis. <laughs> You know, I have to do this. One of my favorite movies. I just have to kind of, well, it's a little bit of a tangent here, but you know, one of the best uh, quick draws, right? I mean, my gosh, look at that, you know, and you talk about actors, some of the best Western actors. I mean, you had Eastwood, you had Wallach, you had, Le wait a second, what about the cat? I actually don't recall there being a cat in that movie. Yeah. Now, at any rate, yeah, it must have been an up, it must have been the, Good, bad, and ugly part two. I don't know. May I missed that. But why is a correct diagnosis important in the first place? Well, a pithy platitude treatment without a correct diagnosis is malpractice. Look, we're trying to increase. We're all working to increase our professionalism, professionalism in the industry. We need to consider that this whole idea of malpractice applies not just to doctors and lawyers, but to us. Treatment without a correct diagnosis is malpractice. If we have dip, dripping trees, for example, again, here's a story on myself. I did not know, this is one of my favorite trees, tulip trees, with these tulip-like flowers. So I came across some tulip trees just covered in this, this dripping sticky material. And yes, I will admit that I took a little taste to see if it was sweet and it was sweet. Look at this dripping onto the leaves. And I started looking for tulip tree aphids. You know, it's a possibility. Aphids are prolific honeydew producers. I started looking for tulip tree scale, a soft scale. And because it's a soft scale, prolific honeydew producers, neither existed. And this is when I learned something. It's very important in terms of diagnostics. What's normal for the tree? It turns out that tulip trees have a very ancient flower structure. They actually belong to the same family as magnolias, magnoliaceae, some of the oldest flowering plants. And so they exude nectar droplets within the cup of the flower. And that just kind of collects at the base to attract the pollinators. So this was normal. This was normal. It wasn't something that was they indicated a pest. So if you see dripping from trees, you know, could it be natural? 
Could it be from an aphid, a plant hopper, or a scale? Actually, in this case, you're going to see it again. This is beneath calico scale. Here's another ID challenge. So this is on red bud. You'll see this year after year in the upper Midwest, very common, these white structures. What are these? Are they soft scales, mealybugs, cottony scale ovisacs, a woolly aphid, bug puke, or maybe bird poo? Well, it turns out it's connected to this tree hopper, two mark tree hopper. They're related to cicadas. And you know, we're gonna have the emergence of the brood 10 periodical cicada this spring. Uh, throughout a large part of the, uh, the Midwest and some parts of the East. And they use their ovipositor, just like cicadas, to insert eggs into the stem. They actually cause very little damage, but then they cover the eggs by the, with this frothy material. Doesn't last long. And this is what it looks like when you cut it open. So this is where you had the egg deposited. My point is that I have now been aware of a number of applications over the years made to control something that did not need to be controlled. This is an oddity, no harm to the overall tree health, but through misidentifications, misapplications occurred. And that's not what we want. So let's now launch into the armored scales. I mentioned pine needle scale. Now, one of its favorite hosts are mugo pines, which have kind of dropped out. They used to be so common in landscaping. They've sort of dropped out. We don't see them nearly as often. And so consequently, you know, pine needle scale populations in landscaping kind of went away for a time, except we can't forget pine needle scale can also infest eastern white pine, firs, Douglas fir, hemlocks, spruces, and junipers, and cedars, true cedars, cedrus. So they're kind of coming back. You need to be aware of this. There are two generations per season. Now notice what I'm doing here. Spring generation crawlers emerge at 305 growing degree days. Summer generation at, at, uh, at 1349 growing degree days. So that is a timing for you to consider doing things, targeting the first instar crawlers with a topical insecticide like pyrethroids, but timing's critical What's the downside of using pyrethroids though? They will take out the enemies of this scale. So you need to be very careful. One thing I would definitely do is before you do this, do an assessment to find out are the plants loaded with even just lady beetles, but are they loaded with enemies? And you may wanna rethink. So here we have pine needle scale, mature females. There are the crawlers, very tiny kind of rusty colored, uh, this is a blow up of the crawlers. And remember, this is the only stage that is mobile. And I just want to proof send the pudding. All these holes, those are parasitoid wasp exit holes. So we had an enemy taking out this scale. This is a real life cryptic case study. This is a phone call a few years back from a Christmas tree grower. I grow Canadian furs. One of my favorite furs is native to West Virginia, my native state. We'd like to call them West Virginia firs, but that doesn't seem to sell as well. Canaan Valley is where they were first identified, not Canaan, Canaan Valley. I grow Canaan firs. Many of my trees are infected with fir fern rust. What can I spray to control the disease? Well, I have to tell you, you know, I, I'd never seen fir fern rust. It does exist. It is a, a, a fungal disease. So I and one of my colleagues quickly visited uh, August 22nd, 2016, there is part of the plantation, and my colleague is looking closely with a hand lens, and we came across a lot of these. What is this? Is a twice-stabbed lady beetle. Doesn't eat rust. That's an indication something else was going on. This is not fur fern rust. This is a scale. It's called cryptomeria scale, and it is a non-native and can be very hard on the true furs. As Canaan furs, for example, or Fraser furs become more and more popular, uh, you, we need to be aware of this non-native uh, fur. It's sometimes called the fried egg uh, scale because that's kind of what they look, the test, the covering is clear, and we can see the females underneath, uh, and it looks like fried eggs. Now, infestation patterns, I'm using the Christmas tree, that Christmas tree plantation, but the same thing occurs in landscapes. Typically, it's bottom up. And you can see this, you know, bottom up, bottom of the trees first, and then move up. 
and then inside out. There's actually a pretty practical reason for this, that when those scale crawlers emerge, if we get a lot of rain, that's gonna wash them off. So this is why we tend to see populations developing more heavily towards the bottom and the inside of the tree. That's the pattern. But for some reason, <clears throat> this scale triggers a pretty uh, dramatic symptom uh, symptomology response on true furs, particularly canines. And you can see this uh, chlorosis, very, very evident, that eventually turns brown. And you, you know, it's again, very easy to see. It is native to Japan, Taiwan, the Koreas, the same place where native cryptomeria comes from. It was accidentally introduced in, in the United States. We're not sure exactly when, but it became a notable problem uh, uh, for about 15 and tw to 20 years in uh, New England and Pennsylvania, and then found in two locations in North Carolina where they have a big Christmas tree uh, industry in 2010. And of course, we found it in Southwest Ohio in 2016. I'm very concerned with this scale because it popped up out of nowhere. We still don't know how it got to Southwest Ohio, um, but just be aware of it because it's more than just canines and true firs, Douglas fir, hemlocks, spruces, and maybe even other conifers. We're not sure of the entire host range yet. Now you notice what I just did there. I only changed the name because hemlock elongate scale has the same host range. That's important to understand. Sometimes you can find them together. So here's that hemlock elongate scale on the underside of the needles. Elongate, because you can see it has an elongate-like structure, very messy, uh, does lead to a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of symptomology uh, through chlorosis. And so here we have an elongate hemlock scale, again, back on the solution fur. And you can see, though, I flipped it over, and what are you seeing on solution? Well, I didn't even know that solution had an infestation until I turned it over. And so you get different responses depending on the host. That's important. That applies across the board, basically with a lot of scale insects. Uh, but look what cryptomeria does on canine fur. Very, very evident. Of course, elongate hemlock scale, elongate, very easy to see, and cryptomeria, you know, the fried egg appearance. Now, if you look at management of cryptomeria, important to understand the symptoms are out there for a very long period of time because, of course, talk about conifer holding on to their needles. The crawlers, though, are going to appear at two different times. There are two generations per season of this scale. The first generation crawlers, about six to 800 growing degree days. Second generation. Now, I want you to notice something. That's quite a spread. What am I saying to you? I'm saying the crawlers are apparent for an extended period of time. Now, this can be controlled uh, with a trunk application of dinotephron, a systemic, and also by a foliar application of bifenthrin. However, I want to caution you on this. Um, we actually believe, and I think Rich Coles is going to be uh, one of the speakers uh, from Connecticut, and he's played a big role in helping me to unravel this. And Rich is convinced, and I'm now convinced, that maybe you can stimulate a higher population by doing this rather than this. Because once again, bifenthrin can take out the uh, non-natives, or I mean, not take out the beneficials, rather. And so we're very concerned now that maybe this isn't the best thing to do. I ke I'm keeping it in, but I want to make you aware that there may be unintended consequences. And of course, the Christmas tree grower I was working with, he did uh, destroy the most heavily infested trees just to get rid of the point source. And that's also an option for different scale insects. Juniper scale, now this is kind of a tricky thing because juniper scale is a European native as well. It has a fairly wide host range. Most often though, you do see it on juniper, but Eastern red cedar, which is actually not a cedar, it's not cedrus, it's juniperus virginiana, that serves as a reservoir. Now, what's interesting about uh, uh, Eastern red cedar is, is this scale hardly produces any symptoms. You, almost, you have to look for the scale, but it can be a reservoir for movement to into the landscaping. Now, why I said this is tricky is this scale as you can see, it's pretty easy to see if you do look. 
and it does produce kind of a thinning canopy that can lead to dieback. But why it's tricky is because we also have so many other things with junipers, of juniper tip midge. We have a couple of, uh, you know, Phomopsis uh, tip blight, for example. We have fungal diseases. We have other insects that can cause tip dieback. Look for this scale before you jump to conclusions. And if you see tip dieback, be aware that it could be caused by more than one thing. But nonetheless, the crawlers hatch at about uh, growing degree days of uh, 571. Full bloom of uh, red java wygelia is a great indicator plant we found. Uh, it can be managed by a wide range of things. But again, use these topicals, uh, particularly pyrethroids, and you may take out what is actually managing these for you. Insecticidal soaps, first time I mentioned it, but they can do a better job. They're more gentle on, um, on the uh, enemies of scales, but it does require multiple applications because remember, insecticidal soaps only kill by direct contact. Once again, the systemic insecticides could be your friend with this. You know, this is another old friend. Obscure scale is a native insect. It is most commonly found on pin oak. And here we see it on pin oak. Why I say an old friend, because this scale has a long history, both in the Midwest and the East. Uh, and we used to see it more frequently for reasons, again, that I don't really understand. Others don't, it sort of went away. We sort of forgot about it. Now it's on the way back. I am seeing it very commonly in landscapes. But it's also found on other hosts, beech, dogwood, hickory, maple, oak, and willow. Now, this is not a direct killer. As a matter of fact, you know, frankly, I probably need to put this idea in much earlier. There are a couple of overarching ideas that I want to keep stressing. And uh, unfortunately, when we do these talks and we talk about individual uh, insect pests, sometimes we forget, well, what applies to one applies to others. This applies really across the board on scale. Scale insects are, I can't think of one that we can say, okay, that is a killer like emerald ash borer. But scale insects do weaken trees. There's no doubt about that. So what they can do then is add to stress that can, again, that can make trees susceptible to other problems or the additional stress can push trees over the edge. So. Again, you know, that's an idea that applies across the board with scales. Another idea is this connection to nitrogen applications. I have to tell you, we need to be very careful about that. So, infestations for this scale typically launch from small twigs. So early detection requires close examination. And I will tell you firsthand, you can prune away this infestation if you catch it early enough. I actually inadvertently controlled an infestation on a fairly, fairly small uh, uh, pin oak by taking samples to use in my diagnostic classes. So I, as I kept coming back, I realized, yeah, oh, it doesn't have any scale anymore. And I didn't realize, well, I had controlled it. Now, this scale is not susceptible. This is pretty much you know, been shown time and again, not susceptible to systemics. So we're left with maybe depending a little more heavily on uh, topicals, uh, but there is some problem with topicals, particularly, for example, horticultural oils, as well as uh, insecticidal soaps and even pyrethroid insecticides. Notice how these scales are stacked on top of each other. The dead females can hide the crawlers. Remember, this is a, uh, an armored scale. And so you only get one shot at first instar nymphs, so the crawlers, that can present an issue. So one thing though, that we do consider that you might want to think about, eggs may be laid you know, and hatch over an extended period of time uh, with topical insecticides that could kill beneficial insects. The best timing, and this has been worked out for some research done uh, in NC State, could be late in the season. You're going to get a lot of egg, know, egg hatch over an extended period of time. If you have to use topicals, go like say mid to late August. This is when the crawler numbers typically peak, but we see a drop in bioally activity at about that same time. It's not a uh, guaranteed thing to happen, but it's something to keep in mind in terms of, of 
preserving, once again, the beneficial insects. Oyster shell, shell scale never went away. It never will go away. Populations rise and fall because over 130 species of hosts, one generation in Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest, they overwinters eggs beneath dead females. I wanna stress that, overwinters as eggs beneath dead females. It's gonna be important here in just a second. Eggs hatch at around growing degree days of 497. As I've already indicated, full bloom of Miss Kim Lilac is a great indicator plant for this. Now, insecticides targeting the crawlers, using this as your timing, uh, it does respond well to IGRs, as well as some systemics, uh, for example, dinotephron. Once again, you know, I tend to, I should have said this earlier. I think you all know this. Dinotephron uh, goes very quickly into plants. Um, uh, it's more water soluble than something like uh, some of the older uh, 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 insecticides the same group, uh, like imidacloprid, it takes a lot longer. So in some ways, uh, you need to think about tinotephron as almost being like a topical because it goes in more quickly, it doesn't last quite as long, and it means targeting is extremely important if you're using dinotephron. Um, but again, you've got a good target for this. And another option is the direct approach pruning and destroying. This was a uh, knockout rose that was pruned back uh, to take out the population of oyster shell scale and it worked. The population did not return. This was cleaned up in one pruning, which, you know, of course, we, it's not a bad idea to prune roses. Of course, you can't prune everything. Uh, this does have a wide host range and here it is on uh, American Elm. You can see why it's called oyster shell scale and, uh, you know, maple, knockout rows, there are the overwintering eggs, you know, with a pin stuck in, so you can see very small size. Uh, those eggs hatch in conjunction with full bloom and Miss Kim Lilac. But what are we seeing here, folks? All, the, each one of these females were taken out by a parasitoid wasp. And this can be substantial. I've actually seen populations crash with no spraying just because of the impact of parasitoid wasps. Now, this is why I really wanted you to pay attention to the overwintering by that scale by eggs, because Japanese maple scale, although it was first discovered in Connecticut in 1914, for reasons that none of us really clearly understand, it took it a long time to sort of start spreading across the horizon. And it's now though found in 15 states including, as you can see, uh, the Midwestern states. So basically from east to west, including Ohio. And it's reported in literature to feed on a, a pretty wide host range, 16 genera, 13 plant families. So this scale could easily overlap with oyster shell scale. And it looks a lot alike oyster shell scale. What's the first thing you notice that different? Oyster shell scale has one generation. This has two generations. It overwinters, not as eggs, but as females. So the life cycle is very different. If you have a life cycle where the insect overwinters as eggs, that means as soon as spring you know, hits, you get an early start. This scale gets a little later start. If you're timing things to control this scale based on oyster shell scales life cycle, you're gonna fail. We suspect that could be partially the reason why this is starting to, this scale is really starting to take off. We think it's because people are mistaking the two and I understand it. In fact, the very first time I saw this scale, I thought it was oyster shell scale. First generation eggs begin to hatch, a very good indicator plant is a full bloom of smoke bush. Second generation hatch, much later in the season. Now, it does respond again to the insect growth regulators, as well as in this case, I said armored scales are difficult to control with systemics. This is an exception. They can be suppressed with systemics and also prune and destroy heavily infested plants. So here you go. Here we have uh, Japanese maple scale. And what you're seeing here is actually European elm scale females, which, move, which they're moving around. 
Uh, this is a soft scale. Remember, they can move around. This is late instar nymphs, or the uh, I almost called it oyster shell scale. But notice how the Japanese maple scale is covered in this white material. There's oyster shell scale. Notice you can see it's not covered in a white kind of. This rubs off, by the way. This doesn't have that. But notice how they do look very similar. Japanese maple scale a little bit more pointed, but they do look very similar. Now you can rub off that white covering to expose that the, the Japanese maple scale. You don't need to do that with oyster shell. If you flip over the females, you can see there's a pin for size. You kind of have these, uh, these lilac colored uh, females under their hard covering, which of course is called tests. This is where I took my finger and rubbed off the white. And notice something else happening is strange here. This is black sooty mold coming from that elm scale, soft scale on the same tree. Again, very white in color, very white in color, but I've rubbed a couple of off so you can see that's what they truly look like. And again, here we have both together with the honeydew coming from European elm scale. Another point to Japanese maple scale is they can settle in crevices, making them a little more difficult to detect with low populations. Wide host range, wide host range. Now we're gonna finish over the next three hours Oops, I see the numbers going down already. Uh, seriously, you got to move pretty fast. We're going to first start with another old friend, cottony maple leaf scale. Notice I'm saying maple leaf scale used to be very common 20, 30 years ago, sort of went away. It's coming back. Be aware of this one. Primarily on red maple, seldom on other maples, but you may also find it on dogwood, sweet gum, uh, hollies, and andromeda. Uh, it is on the underside of the leaves as opposed to cottony maple scale. So put the leaf in there so you can remember that it's on the underside of leaves, whereas, cot uh, whereas uh, cottony maple scale are only on the stems of the host plants. High populations of this scale research years ago showed a very strong association with tree stress, and we're seeing it again. This one overwinters as mobile nymphs on the bark. Remember, this is a soft scale. Moves to the leaves in the spring where they mature, the males and females mate, and then the females produce what people think is the scale. These are dead females that before they die, they start pumping out eggs and, and, and you know, within this structure, the, the white flocculent material that then we call ova sacs. This is what the ova sac looks like for maple a cottony maple scale. This is cottony maple leaf scale. Another point to this scale is underside of leaves. Now here's my car. I pulled up to this tree and at first I was thinking, man, I don't see anything because the upper leaf surface looks, but then you got under the canopy and there they were. And there are the ovisacs I've opened up so you can see they're full of eggs. When those eggs hatch, look what I've done here to help time the egg hatch. I've got that sticky tape on there to see those little tiny crawlers. Of course, this is a soft scale, so it produces a lot of honeydew and then black sooty mold that can fall into other things. But look what else I found. And I'm gonna be monitoring this population. The, the homeowner said it was fine. The, she's not, I was working actually with an arborist and they both agreed they're not gonna do anything, at least this season. Because here is kind of you are what you eat. This is a very important predator of this scale, uh, ladybug beetle larva. Uh, in, in, in this genus Hyperaspis, which also is a genus that is, uh, has uh, enemies of some other scales. And you can see that it looks very similar. In fact, I didn't even see these right off the bat. But a very high population of these lady beetles, so we're going to watch what happens this coming season. Also, when I was taking pictures, look what else I saw, an egg parasitoid wasp at work. So we're going to see what's happening. So the very first thing with cottony maple leaf scale. And I should add, if you are managing cottony maple scale, same idea, there's a strong connection to tree stress, focus on tree health first. This <laughs> volcano mulch on maples or any other tree, I mean, this, I don't know, this is an abomination and it does stress trees. And then work towards pr uh, preserving natural enemies by targeting overwinter late star instar nymphs, for example, with dormant oils. It's going to be not perfect, but it's a good first start. And then target summer nymphs with insecticidal soaps or horticultural oils. May take more than one application, but use the sticky tape to time it. Now, 
first instar crawlers are also susceptible to systemic insecticides like dinotephron in the tree much sooner. Imidacloprid takes a little longer, but you need to apply when eggs are still present to allow uptake of the systemic to be able to then knock out the crawlers over multiple nipple stages. One thing important, and I'm gonna revisit this in just a minute, relative systemics, and I think we all know this, if you're using a stemic, a systemics, please try to avoid drought stress. Uh, keep trees watered and avoid making nitrogen application. That's been very well connected in past years to uh, population outbreaks. Calico scale, oh my gosh. A non-native introduced into California in the 1800s for reasons you don't understand, man, it is really starting to show up uh, uh, throughout much of the Midwest and the East. And it has a very wide host range. And that host range, this list is not based on host evaluation studies. This is by observation. Uh, this is, remember, a soft scale. In the fall, the crawlers leave the leaves and go to stems. This is what they look like. In early spring, then, the females here start maturing, they start puffing up. And as they puff up, they start exuding a lot of honeydew because they're really sucking a lot of juice. And of course that leads to black sooty molds. And eventually, you know, the females mature, they produce eggs, those eggs hatch, and here are the crawlers, very tiny things you can see with this ruler. And those crawlers then migrate to the underside of leaves where they position themselves on uh, leaf veins to insert their mouth parts into what? into phloem vessels. And this is what it looks like in the summer. So these are live females. Very shortly after the eggs are produced, they die. And why that's important is I've had arborists that mistakenly thought they killed them with an insecticide, but they died of natural causes. This is a, the change as you can see in the appearance. And this is a twofer. Here I had dead females, crawlers, as well as black sooty moles. It's a threefer. So we're gonna talk very briefly and very quickly about applying integrated pest management for this. IPM has been around since 1967 and let's first start with a problem. Chemical applications are problematic. I've even been part of various uh, efficacy studies and we've had a lot of problems, uh, but we do know that even though we've had highly variable results, I think uh, Cliff Sadoff is gonna be a speaker in this series. He had a graduate student that did very well on honey locusts uh, using dinotephron. The difference between his trial and one I was involved with was that the trees were irrigated. And so I think there's a very strong connection there. And so does Cliff, I believe. But what about the cultural approach? Well, we can have a direct approach with this and I'm not making this up. If they're small trees, we sometimes forget uh, you can physically remove these. You know, and there you have the scrubber and there I've removed them. And, you know, you can pretend that, you know, what a world, what a world. But this is based on research done by uh, uh, researchers at the University of Kentucky. I want you to notice that they were using scrubbers. They couldn't reach the top of all the trees, which partially accounts for the fact that they didn't get, you know, quite the same, uh, you know, zero. But look at the difference between doing the scrubbing, even with a dry scrub, and no scrubbing. It's highly effective on small trees. Another hey, cultural approach. Yes. Hey, Joe. Pardon me. We're, we're running up against time right here. Um, yeah. Can I finish just with this scale? And sure. I'll sure. be done with it. Yeah. Thank you, I'm, Joe. I'm, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. An indirect approach with kind of pulls things together is support tree health. Folks, I've seen this time and again with this scale. This was part of a study, an efficacy study that we used. And you can see these trees, these honey locusts have severe dieback, but look where they're located. And this is non-irrigated. Heavy scale populations, but the trees are in trouble based on the site, same here. This tree is less than a, well, it's within walking distance of these trees. And look at this nice canopy, but look where it's growing. And yet look at the shot I took with this tree. This tree was heavily infested. What's the difference? A much better site. And let's face it, what our clients want to know is whether or not they can have a full canopy. And so just by a better location, except you shouldn't plant, you know, that's not a good place because I need to park a car, this can be managed. Well, I'm gonna skip ahead. I apologize for that. And again, you know, running out of time, Magnolia scale, 
but we are out of time. And again, very similar thing with Magnolia scale. Um, just want to stress one last thing, a very, just one final point. You know, with time flying like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana, that's my only Marxism. A final point is this, knowledge is of two kinds. We know a subject ourselves, or we know where we can find information on it. I promised I would do this. Oh, thank you, thank you, I, nice, nice applause, I appreciate that. And here we have where you can sign up for the, uh, buck, the Beagle Alerts. I only missed one scale, so I'm going to uh, exit out of here, stop sharing, and then we can handle questions. Joe, that was totally awesome. Very detailed, ah. comprehensive presentation and uh, quite informative. And those photos were awesome. So we have a couple of questions. Simon Nasty, what are some of the other predators of hard scales? Well, yeah, I, I really focused pretty heavily, didn't I, on uh, parasitoid wasps. Don't forget, though, that also uh, we have a lot of predators. And the lady beetles, that twice stabbed lady beetle, love to pop up scales and feed on the underneath of the scale. I showed the... Um, uh, uh, the other uh, lady beetle larva on a soft scale, uh, cottony maple leaf scale, but it, it will also feed on, uh, on, on armored scales. Thank you for talking about least top, uh, toxic options. Well, that's the whole idea, Leslie. And it does fit. Now, I need to say something because I really appreciate being asked by Rainbow uh, Tree Care to do this because I've had a long relationship, Jeff, as you know, with your company. And that's one thing that I constantly see that you really focus on tree health and you really focus on trying to do things to help, you know, reduce the need for applications. But when you need to bring out the big guns, you bring out the big guns. So I do want to recognize my, my hosts for that as well. Uh, your presentation, always, oh, well, thank you, uh, Blake. That's very nice. I, I owe some people money, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> well, just really quickly, just a very brief summary. Um, you know, we take this uh, uh, toolbox approach to mm -hmm. uh, anything, not just scale, but all pests. And what method is best? It depends. And that's the answer, as we all know. Time of year, cost of treatment, client preference, level of infestation. And so this is something that Rainbow offers uh, through their uh, territory managers, we offer this information. And I just want to move on very quickly. We all know about the life cycle. And as you mentioned, Joe, the first instar, the crawlers are the most susceptible. Uh, and that is, and that's why it's so important to uh, identify that particular scale so that you can track down and, uh, and make the application when those crawlers are active. And also, as you mentioned that, um, you know, that a lot of the uh, neonicotinoids, especially with the metacloprid or Zytec is not going to work uh, very well on hard scales. So this is the sort of approach Rainbow takes. We offer uh, a virtual and face-to-face -face training on management of soft and armored scales. Uh, one thing that Rainbow does offer is we have over 50 protocols on scale throughout the country. So please reach out to your territory manager and you will be able to uh, get a copy of that, uh, of course, at no charge. Uh, please also uh, go to your territory manager uh, and ask for this hard copy of scale management guide, or you can go on the website and download it um, at your leisure. I like that you use Calico so, scale for um, that. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's... And then um, as far as getting CEUs, uh, make sure uh, you go to the chat box and there will be a link where you can then fill out that form and uh, get your credit. And so we have some upcoming webinars that you can see. Spotted lanternfly is going to be a hot one. EAB is sort of old news, but it's still prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, growing your PHC business is a really great um webinar that I think everybody should really take advantage of. And uh, Joe, I can't thank you enough for uh, that excellent and very, um, uh, let's say entertaining presentation. <laughs> and, I, and I do uh, like your Buckeye sense of humor. <laughs> yes, yes. So if you would um, take a few minutes, uh, all the attendees, thank you for 
uh, taking time out of your schedule to attend. Uh, please fill out that survey to help us uh, improve our uh, webinars in the future. Well, thank you for asking me and thanks everyone for uh, bearing with us for the entire presentation. Awesome, thank you, Joe. And if it's okay, I think we might have some time just for a few more questions. Um, there are some good ones that are coming in here um, around, I believe, um, oh, I just lost it. The best control methods for Prunicola scale. Um, yeah. Comments on that one. Yeah, I've, I, uh, Dan, I actually do not have experience with that scale. Um, so I don't want to mislead you. Remember how I started. We don't know everything. So I apologize. I don't have good. Uh... Now, Jonathan's asking, missed oyster shell scale egg hatch. Uh, please pass along or I can. Uh... <laughs> of course, you know, one thing I do want to make sure that you all do is, is please listen to this recording if you would. I went pretty fast through some of the growing degree days. I apologize for that. That was the interest of time. But that's so important. That's why I spent time at the beginning talking about the connection uh, between phenological indicators uh, and, and growing degree days. And again, the oyster shell scale, the phenological indicator, the Miss Kim Lilac is really solid. Uh, Laura's asking, we saw several magnolia scale infestations last year in central Ohio. What would you suggest for treatment versus a moderate infestation? Well, you know, I, I, that was one I couldn't get to. That was at the end. Uh, magnolia scale is a little bit more uh, susceptible if you want to go systemics. Uh, the, the systemics have really looked very good. In, in fact, magnolia scale kind of led us down a false path, in my opinion, relative to calico scale. Uh, magnolia scale responds very readily. It may be host related. I have to suggest that but does respond very heavily to uh, the systemics. But I also want to say if it's a small tree and you're out there, you know, I've had more of, of, of people I've worked with on small trees that have brushed these off. I can't emphasize that enough. It is a very good approach. Um, uh, Joe, so uh, just so you know, a proxite is our pyroproxifen and oh yeah uh, yeah it, it's identical it's identical the distance and it's uh, it has a couple of other advantages um it's a it's a better price point and we all know that it can be used both on hard and soft scales and so i just wanted to get that in there well i'm glad you did that because i i i just have to admit jeff i i goofed on that i tried to go through to that's why i went with generic on about everything and i i realized and i meant to say that <laughs> that I, uh oh, uh, but I'm glad you brought that up. And that's why I tried to stay as much as I could with generics so that people, you know, because we do know common names of these do change over time too, but, uh, but I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so, uh, Good. okay, Steve is asking uh, Ohio experienced very hit or miss control with Dinotephron. Uh, any theories as to why with Magnolia scale? Well, from my experience, Steve, and I, I really do have to say, this is one where I'm going to try to be tactful. Uh, the, the situations that I was involved with, because Magnolia scale has really roared back, it, it kind of went, you know, under the radar, and now we're starting to see a reemergence of it. Uh, timing has been an issue, and also another issue is, and I, again, be tactful, make sure that you are applying the proper dosage according to the label. Uh, so two of the situations I was involved with, they were way under rate. They weren't doing the calculation correctly. The other is this idea of watering. So, you know, we had a bit of, uh, you know, we had a mini drought in the summer here in Ohio. Uh, other areas didn't quite so much. And I cannot stress that enough. If you're using systemics, you know, I, I think the labels all say prior to application, uh, making sure that you consider irrigation. But we sometimes forget after application too, and not allowing those trees to go into uh, moisture stress. So those are theories. Those are speculations. I, I will tell you that it was a, there was some problems with, with rates 
And I can't, I, I just, I, I want to be very clear about that. That's a, I think we all agree with the experience with systemics. That's extremely important. Make sure your rates are, are, are good. I think that's it, right, Jeff? Or I think it's time to conclude for today. Thanks to everyone for um, staying on a little bit longer. And Joe, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Yeah, it's been um, my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. All right, all. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and escape and leave the uh, presentation, leave the time. I have to give another talk here in just less than an hour. So thanks for bearing with us. And thanks for asking me to be uh, to speak to the group. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Good one, everyone.